Hello and welcome to the session in which we would look at consolidation and the different method of consolidating financial statements. This topic is important because as time goes by, the complexities of the financial statements consolidation gets harder and harder. So it's very important for the students to understand the basic concepts, the basic theory behind, behind consolidation. Why? It's going to make your life easier during consolidation. You'll be able to understand the journal entries. Why are we debiting certain accounts? Why are we crediting certain accounts? Why are we doing this? What's the end product? What is the theory behind what we are doing? So this topic is important, whether you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate. Whether you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate, I strongly suggest you take a look at my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your CPA review course. I am a useful addition. I provide an alternative explanation, an alternative resource for you to complete your work. So simply put, I teach you the material. The review course will help you prepare for the exam. Think of me as a backup to your CPA review course. Your risk to try me is one month of subscription. Your potential gain is passing the exam itself. Are you willing to take that risk? And if not for anything, take a look at my website to find out how well or not well your university doing on the CPA exam. I do have resources for other courses and CPA sections. If you haven't connected with me on LinkedIn, please, please do so. Take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation. Like this recording, share it with other, connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. So financial statements consolidation, as I was just saying, it gets more and more complicated with time, but the basic objective remain the same. And that's to combine all your assets, all your liabilities, all your revenues, expenses, and equity in the consolidated financial statements. And this occurs, this process occur through the worksheets, uh, the worksheet and the consolidation entries. And as a result, we produce a single set of financial statements. Now, some topics needs kind of, it's good to understand those topics. They need special attention. One of them is consolidated net income. So what happens is after we buy the company, subsequent to the acquisition, we must report our consolidated net income, which is the net income of the parent and the subsidiary. So what we do first, we separately combine the revenues and expenses of the parent with those of the subsidiaries. Now, also what we have to do, we might have to increase our expenses a little bit, especially if we purchase those assets from the subsidiary higher than the cost. So simply put, the subsidiary's expenses, they might have those expenses based on the original book value. So let's assume they purchased a building 10 years ago or last year, or it doesn't matter when, for a million dollar, and they amortizing this for 10 years. This is their original cost. Therefore, their depreciation is $100,000 per year. Now, when we purchased this building, we paid for the same building 1.5. Therefore, if there's 10 years remaining, now we're going to be depreciating 150,000. So we're going to be depreciating an excess of 50,000. This is called excess amortization. So we have to include this excess amortization through an adjustment. So this is when we do the, the adjustments to reflect the amortization of the excess of the parent consideration over the subsidiaries. This is what we are discussing here. So we might have additional expenses. Now, not all consolidation will take that into account. The full equity method will do that. Also, if there's any intercompany transaction, like account receivable, we sold them something on account, they purchased from us something on account, we can, we, we cancel, we eliminate those intercompany accounting and uh, intercompanies payables and receivable. Another account that we need to be comfortable with is investments, and we need to understand it. It creates investment. It's a little bit more complicated than income, in my opinion. So remember, for internal record keeping purposes, we're going to have to select an accounting method, and we're going to see there are three of them to monitor the relationship between the two companies through the investment account, because the investment account is what is the representation of the parent investment and the subsidiaries. Now, the investment account, it's going to vary over time as a result of income, as well as a result of the method that we chose. Okay, And these differences would be reflected, the fact the periodic consolidation, only the consolidation process, not the combined entity figures. So, so at the end of the day, the investment account, by the way, the invest investment account, regardless of which method we are using, the investment account would always be equal to zero. However, on the parent company, the investment account will differ depending on which method we are using. Again, we did not discuss the method yet. I just want to introduce you to the investment account. So in the consolidated 
the investment account is always zero. It has to be zeroed out because what we purchased, we purchased through that investments accounts, we purchased their assets, their liabilities, and as a result, their equity, right? Because assets minus liabilities equal to equity. So it has to zero it out. But the investment account might be different on the parent's company. Okay. Also, just like likewise, the income figure accrued by the parent is removed each period. So if we accrue any any revenue from the subsidiary, will have to be removed, and what's left is only the subsidiary's net income. And here are the three methods that we that we use. We have the equity method, we have the initial value method, and we have the partial equity method. Now, all three methods start with the same investment account, and that investment account represents what we paid for that company initially. It doesn't matter which method, when we purchase an asset, we record it at its cost, historical cost, which is consideration transferred. Now, after the acquisition, the three method will produce different figures. Notice, on the parent's company only, not on the consolidated sheets. On the parent's company, we might have a different investment account number. We might have a different income recognizer from the subsidiary's activities. And as a result, if we have a different income, we might have a different retained earnings. But this only happens on the consolidated I'm sorry, on the parent company, on the consolidated, on the total, it doesn't matter which method we use, they all should be the same. Let's take a look, an overview about the three methods, starting with the equity method, the, the, the method that we should be most comfortable and familiar with, because if you understand the equity method, you will easily understand the partial equity. If you understand the equity and the partial equity, the initial value is a piece of cake, right? So the equity method is using full accrual, and hopefully you know what full accrual is. It's basically maintaining the parent's investment and account for related income over time. So simply put, when the subsidiaries report net income, the parent company will accrue it. So as soon as the subsidiaries earns it, the parent company will accrue it. How does it accrue it? What entry do we make when the, when the subsidiaries reported net income? Remember, we debit investment, we credit income so we debit investment so we increase our investment in the subsidiaries and we increase our income also the equity method accounts for excess amortization so remember what i said earlier if we purchase a building for 1.5 million and the value of the building at the subsidiaries was a million as a result what happened is we have an excess amortization of 50,000 per year assuming we're we are depreciating this building over 10 years so what happened as a result usually we're going to debit income reduce income and reduce our investment for that excess amortization. It's the opposite of when we accrue income, when we accrue income. Also, if there's any unrealized gross profit on intercompany transaction, we defer those. For example, if we sold them or they purchased from us inventory or if we sold them inventory and that inventory is not resold yet, well, guess what? We're gonna have a deferred profit, therefore we debit income, credit investment. Same thing as this entry, which is the opposite of the when we accrue net income. Also, when there's a dividend, the dividend, remember, under the equity method, we debit dividend, or eventually we receive cash and we credit the investment. So we reduce the investment by the amount of the dividend. So notice what's happening under the equity method. We are keeping track our, of our investment account as changes in the equity of the subsidiaries. It creates, simply put, a parallel between the parent's investment and the changes in the underlying equity of the acquired company. They make a profit. We increase our investment. They pay dividend. We reduce our investment. This method is referred to sometimes as the single line consolidation. It's popular where management would require or would want to measure the subsidiaries, subsidiaries, subsidiary profit under the accrual based income figures. This is the equity method. The partial equity method, obviously, it, by the name of it, it should be similar to the equity method, which is similar. So every time we, we, they, they earn the income, we accrue it. So the income is, simply put, debit investment, credit income from the subsidiary. Every time they declare dividend, we debit dividend, credit investment from the subs for the subsidiaries. However, we don't do the other two adjustments, which is the excess amortization and the deferral. So we don't make those other adjustments. Okay. So we end up with a net income figure uh, as computed from the parent's company approximating consolidated total but without the effort of the full application method uh, of the equity method, okay? So you will see this when we do an example, but this is what's gonna end up happening. Now, again, the total for both companies will be the same, the consolidated. What's gonna differ is those consolidating entries, consolidation entries. The initial value method, in contrast to the other two methods, we don't recognize any income as it's earned. So we don't use the accrual method. So what we do is we wait until they pay the dividend. 
So we recognize the dividend income as they pay it. And usually from the time they declare it until the time they pay it, it's very short. Therefore, simply put, the initial net to a great degree, it recognizes or it's measuring the subsidiary's performance under the cash method. So if you, if you hear the word initial value method, think of the cash value, the cash basis of accounting, because we recognize income as we receive it in form of dividend. So why do we use the initial value method? It's easy. It's very easy. Just we wait until we receive the cash from them. It's ease of application. We don't need to measure the subsidiary's performance on an accrual basis. So it's not needed. So simply put, we want to measure their performance on the cash basis. This is when we use this method. So make sure you are familiar with all three methods. Make sure you have a good understanding of the equity method because the partial equity will become easier. The initial value, it's easiest of the two. Now, obviously, we have to work an example illustrating those three methods and preferably one example showing you the difference between the three because this is what I just went over is theory. You know, it's good if you were able to follow, but what's even better if I work an example showing you all three methods. At the end of this recording, I'm going to remind you whether you're an accounting student or a CPA candidate, farhatlectures.com is an alternative resource, a backup system to your CPA preparation. You're going to learn you're going to invest in yourself once for the CPA. Once you pass it, you no longer have to renew this investment. So do it wisely. Don't shortchange yourself. The CPA is worth it. Your risk to try me is one month of subscription. Your potential gain is passing the exam. Good luck. Study hard. And of course, stay safe.